without and still be a, uh, what, what the world wants you to be, this nice productive individual. Of course, uh, that's also something we need to look at in, in the lists. So those three lists, see how you go making the three lists? And I also add a fourth list for myself. Sort of the truth versus an error list. Right. Who needs to go to the toilet? Because we had a drink, remember, half an hour ago. <laughs> yeah? All right, well, let's say we stop for five minutes, we'll have a, have a go to the toilet, and then we'll come back. So we'll just have a break now for a few minutes. I promised you this would happen. So you've got to think about it as a law of attraction event for the both of you. Mm -hmm. So if um, if you have anger with mum, then mum obviously created it somewhere, mm -hmm. and she has a set of emotions she needs to look at. Mm -hmm. So when you allow, so I'm not suggesting you yell and scream at her. What you, what you do is you connect with your emotions, do all yelling and screaming at home and all that mm -hmm. stuff. And then when you're finished and you realise that uh, mum's doing some things here, still doing some things that is impacting my free will, you go and talk to your mum. Mm. And and when you talk to her, that gives her the chance now to look at the truth. Mm. Does that make sense? But if you avoid it, then only one of you is benefiting. Mm. And that's mm. the beauty of acting with everybody around you, mm. is that you're actually helping every person by you staying in truth with them. Mm. I understand that logically, mm -hmm. and I still have a limiting belief that um, because of her age and who she is, she's so set in her ways and thinking, you know, no, that's... Not my place Honestly, to if she doesn't unset in her ways, she could be set in her ways for another 50 years or 100 years in the spirit world when I she understand passes. That. So, so no matter how old a person is, mm. we need to unsettle them in their ways. Oh, okay. Okay. We need to help them reconnect with so themselves. So being in my truth is actually an advantage for her if I do unsettle her. Okay. It's actually so an active life. Actually, okay. So don't actually be concerned about whether I think it's going to help or not. That's not my job. You d if you're addicted to the outcome, then... No, I'm not. Yeah, so don't addict mm. to yourself to the outcome. So in other words, if I come and do this talk and only two people rock up, mm. then, then, I understand that. then I don't addict myself to that outcome. Mm. The other two people I want to talk to at the moment. So. I, got the, I got that. Yeah. And, and the thing is that I, it, I speak it with... Everybody else I meet in life. So there's an emotional reason why you're why avoiding it with your mum. Of course. Of course. <laughs> I'm just hoping I can do with that without upsetting her. That's so. the emotional reason. <laughs> can you see that? That's the fear. The fear is she will get upset, so she probably will. Mm. And this is what you'll need to address: is that why are you mm. changing your life to suit her fears mm. and to suit her anger? And that means that you're afraid of her anger you're afraid of her sadness. So you're responsible for her anger, you feel, and you feel you're responsible for her sadness. I mean, I'm, I'm the kind of person that if a dog upsets her, she'll go and lie down in bed until she feels better. Yeah, well, and you can say to her, don't do that, Ma, let yourself feel your emotions. Mm. So you can say that. But, yes. but you are so addicted to making her feel better, mm. and that's causing lots of trouble in your life. Much more trouble than you actually are aware of. Now I feel like I'm Show you the video. All right. That's five minutes. That was.
What's, what's a modern day version of give you an inch and you take a mile? <laughs> have to come up with that. <laughs> give you a millimetre and come up, you take a, a kilometre. That doesn't sound as good, does it? <laughs> All right. This is also a very... Um, oh, just one thing, James. Could you just make sure that there's not too much close-up of me, that you can actually yeah. see more of my body when you're... Yeah. Um, not that I think I've got a good body. I'm just saying... <laughs> I'm just saying when I move around, it gets lost. That's all. Um, truth versus error. Um, this is a really good little exercise to do if you can get the time to do it in a week. So again, it's something you can do each week. Now one of the main reasons why most of us have a lot of difficulty accessing emotion is because we have a lot of beliefs inside of us that are erroneous beliefs about emotion and about ourselves, in fact. Right? And it's really important to be able to see the difference, even intellectually see that there's a difference. And that will help you actually access the emotion. So let me give you an example of a few of these types of emotions. Right? The error emotion is, I cannot cope with this emotion. How many of you have felt that? I can't cope with this emotion. I just can't cope with this emotion. Well, that is an error belief. Right? So the thing is, if we don't identify a lot of these beliefs that are errors that just pop up in our, into our awareness, what's going to finish up happening is that we're going to keep allowing them to exist within us. Alright? Now what's the truth? God made me able to experience everything. Right? That's the truth. That's the truth I'm aiming for. Now remember, that truth is not going to enter me in my mind. It can't enter me in my mind. It's going to enter me emotionally eventually. It can only enter me emotionally when this error released, is released from me, right? This error, this feeling that I have that I can't cope with this emotion. But if I have at least my mind going, God, may be able, God made me able to cope with this emotion. My error belief is I cannot cope with this emotion. That's going to shut down the experience of an emotion. But, it, but if I have this truth belief also flicking over of God may be able to experience every emotion, then there's a higher likelihood I'll get to the emotion. Can you see that? So, if I say I cannot cope with these emotions, what would I do emotionally to do that? I would go into that emotion. I can't cope, I can't cope, I can't cope, and I go crying, I'm crying, because I can't cope, I can't cope. That's actually a release of a causal emotion. Because a causal emotion is, to, this causal emotion is actually controlling my access to other emotions. Does that make sense? So a lot of our blockages to causal emotion are causal emotions that we need to release that are belief systems that we have about ourselves. So this belief system is false. God made you able to cope with absolutely everything within you. So what I'm suggesting to you is every week, notice some of the belief systems that you have that are false. That if you were in an at-one-ment state, you probably wouldn't believe. If you were connected with God 100% of the time, you wouldn't believe. How about this one? Error belief. I can't trust God. Huh? Many of us have that belief, by the way. The only person on this planet or anywhere in this universe that I can trust is moi, myself. That's what we believe. So we don't go, don't trust anyone. Right? What's the truth belief? God is the most trustworthy being in the universe. <laughs> right? God is the most trustworthy. <laughs> 
So if I notice this, I can't trust God come up during the week, I can then go into that emotionally. I can actually start feeling what that feels like, to not be able to trust anyone else but myself. I can actually connect with that emotionally. And the truth belief is where I'm headed for. The beauty of knowing where you're heading for is it's like all of a sudden there's clarity. right? Even when you're in the midst of a terrible emotion, you can have clarity sometimes because you know that the truth is this flip side, if you like. Now, I'm not saying... To, the, the danger of doing this, by the way, is that you use it as an intellectual exercise to avoid the emotional belief. I'm not saying you do that. All I'm saying is list your errors and then write down next to them what you believe the truth is if you were connected with God 100% of the time. That's what I'm suggesting. And that will help you deal with the error. Because a lot of times we have these terrible beliefs in us that are not true that then dominate our life. How about this one? I cannot cope with pain. Uh, the whole headache tablet industry is, is based on that belief. We've got a headache, bang, 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 bang. That's just too much. I've got to go and get my tablet. You know, pop the tablet and it's all good for a little while. And then next day, bang, bang, bang. It's far better if we can deal with the emotional cause. So what, how can I get into this emotional cause? I actually don't take the headache pill. And what I do is I feel this bang, 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 bang thing going and I allow myself to connect with my sadness about this pain. I allow myself to connect to this fear that I have about this pain. Right? Because I can, the true belief is, I can cope with everything. God made you able to cope with everything, including pain. Do you know down the track in your existence, you'll have something painful happen to yourself and you'll heal it straight away. You won't even... Won't, you won't even consider pain in your life anymore. You think of how many times in a day-to-day -day life that you consider pain right now. You think about it. Why do you wear certain clothes? Why do you do certain things? Why do you drive a certain way? Why do you put your seatbelt on? You know, there's all these different things. I know you need to put your seatbelt on from a law perspective, but what is driving you with everything you do. Why do you avoid going and doing some fun things? Because I might get hurt, you know? Why do you cross the road a certain way? Oh, but I might get hurt the other way. You know, there's all these things that we do, most of the time unknowingly, but are actually driven by this belief that I've got to avoid pain. Now, now obviously, if I have this belief going on, I'm like in a prison, it, at, its, at its extreme, I won't do anything. And this is why some people don't do anything. Because they are so afraid that they feel that anything they do is going to create pain. So they don't do anything. So we need to allow ourselves to look at this belief system. So write down these belief errors. Now you will notice if you deal with causal emotion, your belief systems will change. And you'll look back through your diary, you'll go, wow, I had that belief a year ago. And I don't even think of that now. I'll give you an idea of some beliefs I had. I used to... I couldn't go shopping. I could not go shopping. I used to... This is when I was in my 20s. And I was married, we had two children. I could not go shopping. I was so afraid to go into a shopping centre. The reason why I was so afraid is every time I walked into the shopping centre, it felt like there were like thousands of eyes looking at me all the time. And I just got freaked out about it so much that in the end I used to stay in the car and I used to do some work or read a book while my wife went shopping. Right? Just, that it, just that I was uncomfortable going shopping. Yeah. yeah. And my wife loved shopping, so it wasn't any... But it's any uh, mix match, a mixture of error-based emotions, right? So, so what did I do after that? So, this was after after um, I broke up from the relationship, and I realised I was in such a mess emotionally, and I was in such a dark place emotionally. I didn't know what to do, you know. 
And then I realised I just had this huge fears, like these bars that were in my prison. I just had this prison of my own making. So I decided I had to start challenging my fears. So what I did was I decided twice a week that I'd go to a shopping centre, the biggest shopping centre in the place where, that, that we lived, or near the place that we lived, was one of these great big, like it's a similar size to, uh, what's it down the road here? Chermside, Ch 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 similar size to that. And, and I decided I'd go there twice a week for, for four hours at a time, and all I would do, I would have to stay in the environment for four hours. Now, whether I shopped or not was immaterial. I had to just stay there. I just made myself stay there. Right? Lots of emotions come up. Because initially, when I stayed there, I couldn't walk into the shops to get even my clothes. I would only ever buy clothes where there wasn't any shop assistants. Who's ever done that in their life? Yeah, there's probably a few. All I would do is I'd only go into a shop where there were no assistants because I was so afraid to even ask for somebody to help me find something. So, I, so, so initially, it took a few months, initially, all I did was I sat on a chair in the shopping centre. And after a while, like, it didn't take long, that uh, that became quite scary because someone I would walk past me, you know, in their shopping, and even in a big shopping centre, you know, eventually you get back to walk past again at another time, right? And then I'd start noticing people notice me sitting in the same place two hours later, you know, and looking at me and projecting that, oh, what's that idiot doing? Like, and so because I was so sensitive to that emotion, I then realised, oh, I'm in the same place. I can't stay in the same place here. You know? So I had to work my way through this projection. And then, and then, I, then I started walking around a bit. You know? And then all these people still looking at me and I'd try and hide and whatever else. And then after a while I, got, I could walk comfortably. And during this time, twice a week, I went to a fellow who did mind-body work. You know? And he would actually, a lot of times, trigger emotions that the next week I would notice that I'd let go when I went to the shopping centre. And so I got to the point then, by the end of a few months, that I had dealt with all of my shopping phobias. And as Mary will tell you now, I'm a shopaholic. And that's a different story. But now when we go shopping, it's really fun, isn't it? Like, we go shopping, it's like, I I'm, I'm really enjoy shopping, like, now. So when Mary's, Mary's shopping for women's clothes, I go in the women's shop and pick up all the stuff off the racks and put them into dryer on. And so Mary's, Mary spends all of her time just sitting in the booth putting on different clothes and coming out, basically. Um, and I just really love the whole experience. It's really joyful. And women really project at you when you have an attentive male in a, in a um, shop. Yeah. It's really different for me. So, they, so you get these shop assistants that are women. Some of them like the fact that I do it for Mary. Others are at Mary. And like, so, so there's all these different projections that happen now as a result. But I really enjoy the process. And, uh, and so now it's really joyful for me shopping. And... Uh, the other problem I had is I would never go up to somebody and ask them where something was. How many of you have feel the same way? You'd never go to somebody and ask them. A few of Well, I, I was terrible with it. I would never ask anybody. What I, what I would do is I'd get on the internet, I'd check this out, I'd check that out, I'd read books, I'd do everything but ask somebody who might know. Everything, if you can imagine that. So often it took me like months to find out how to do something that I could have just gone and asked somebody or phoned them, but I, I didn't want to. So that really triggered me. So what I started to do then was every time I went into a shopping centre, I started just asking people even when I didn't, when I already knew, right? Just to challenge this emotion in me. And it brought up lots of emotions for me of not being worthy, being misunderstood, and lots of other emotions. Like, so lots of emotions come up as a result. So what I'm suggesting is, with the fear list that you have, start doing things to challenge some of those fears. Right? So what we're going to do next week, I'll give a talk about fear again, and we'll talk about fear in a lot more detail about psychologically and also physiologically what's happening inside of you with regard to fear. But then I will start looking at how can we challenge these fears emotionally? And what I'll do is I'll make a heap of suggestions of movies to watch, books to read, and so forth, and uh, to trigger these fears to help you feel them and release them inside of you. And so what happened 
the beauty of the journal for me was that I could look back and, and a year later I could look back and say, wow, like, I don't even have that feeling in me anymore. I don't have that feeling in me anymore. It's a beautiful thing to not have a controlling feeling in you anymore and to notice it. And after a while you notice you drop one, two, five, ten, you I don't have you know, I'm not scared of my mother anymore. I'm not scared of my father anymore. I'm not scared of somebody's anger anymore. I'm not scared of what a spirit might do to me anymore. I don't worry anymore about an accident happening to me. You know? I was insured to the hilt at one point in my life. Like you know what it's like, yeah. You go and you get all this medical insurance, you get all this, you know, accident, dismemberment, coverage, I've got that as well. You know the, the coverage that has, uh, if you get sick, what's it called? Uh, disability coverage, get that as well. And, and life and death cover, of course you get that as well. And so like I was like, literally I was spending over a thousand dollars a month on insurance, just on personal insurance. Twelve or twelve thousand dollars every year on personal insurance because that's how worried I was about my life. Right? So, so why is that all happening? Because there's all these fears and it all needs to be worked way through. And of course my law of attraction was that some of those things would, would of course happen to me because I was afraid of them happening. And so I was, quite, I was sick quite often. When I say quite often, usually once a month. Usually for a week or so I was sick. Which is of course the reason why I, I didn't... The answer to that was get more insurance. Uh, not deal with the emotion. You know, it wasn't until I started dealing with emotion I go, oh, I haven't got asthma anymore. Wow. Like, and all that was was a few months of crying right, about some causal emotional things, but it just disappeared completely, like gone. I used to take permanent antihistamines. Who's a permanent antihistamine user? You know what I mean? None of you. What's wrong with you? Like, <laughs> I was permanent with it though. I used to take, you know, there was Zadine and all these other types of things back in my day when I was taking it. I would almost go anywhere and I would get allergic to it. A cat, a, you know, any, if we drove down past, you know, a wheat field, bang, I'd be allergic to that. And it would be streaming. My eyes would be streaming. My nose would be running. I'd be, the reason why I still carry hankies around with me is because, you know, how many people do this nowadays? Not very often. Uh, some, I know. <laughs> but not very many. And, and the reason why I still do it is because I've just got into this physical habit now because I, if I didn't have a hanky with me, I was dead. I was a goner. Like, now I cry all the time, so it's handy. But the... the <laughs> The beauty was that once I started crying, all of those disappeared. All of them. And, if, and I have my journal, so I know that. I know all of that happened. I know what I was like. And uh, of course my mother and father know what I was like too with regard to all of those things because they had to put up with my ver years and years and years of having these ailments. I don't have any of them anymore. At all. Right? And I, can, I know what was the release. The release was a lot of crying. There was a lot of tears. And, and each thing had certain things involved in it. You know, my allergy to cats linked to my father's hatred of cats. And there was all these other things that happened. And once they were released, all disappeared. And the beauty of your journal and also looking at your error list and also doing these things every week is you keep a track of that. You see, a lot of times, many of us don't realise that we're changing. And so we th we, when we go through a hard time, we give up. Because we don't realise that actually the other hard times we went through, we got through and we changed. And we released some things. So it's really great having, having these mechanisms, if you like, to keep track of the fact that you're changing. And, and sometimes it's so interesting reading the journal of a person who's on the divine love path. Really interesting. You'll see the areas that you haven't dealt with in a year. You'll see the areas that you've dealt with in a year. And you'll see what's going on inside of yourself. And you can't fool yourself when you have a journal happening. You can't fool yourself that I've dealt with something when a year ago you wrote down it and yesterday you wrote down the same thing. So you can't fool yourself with that. 
Voilà. Monthly. Just one thing on your monthly list. Plan something once a month that you really love and make sure you do it. Plan something once a month and make sure you do it. So this is all if you're having trouble connecting with your emotions. When you're not having trouble connecting with your emotions, a lot of these things will happen automatically, by the way. You won't have to plan once a month to do something that's loving to yourself because you'll be starting to do it every day. You won't have to every week look at your fear list because every moment you know what you're afraid of. Do you know what I mean? But initially it takes, takes a bit of effort to get from this place where I'm totally in the dark with regard to all of my emotions and what I want is total exposure with all my emotions. That's what I want. And I need to get from one place to the other place. And what I'm suggesting were the different methods that I've used to get from one place to the other place. Does that make sense? Now I don't need to make a list anymore. I know what I desire. Every single moment almost I know what I desire. I know what I'm afraid of right now. I know what, I, what makes me angry. Very little now, but I still know what makes me angry. And I know it moment by moment. And I connect with the emotion that's underneath moment by moment almost mo just about 100% of the time. Not all the time, but almost 100% of the time I can feel the emotion and connect to it straight away. And it doesn't worry me, doesn't worry me where I am. Now? Could you share some of your desires? Some of my desires? Um. <laughs> um. Well, what I want to do, <coughs> what I want to do is actually list. Um, I'll list God's priority list for you, and then I'll talk about my desires with that list. How's that sound? Yeah, I just, um, I'm just thinking. Oh, my desires, and I'm thinking. Mm. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, let's look, let's look at this next thing first, which is a priority list. So this is another thing that I do. Um, you can do this once a month or once a week or up to you. I call it... I actually call it my love list. Or the love, my love priority list. In the first century, I said these words, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Do you know what I mean by that? Like, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. You see, what you finish up doing most in your life is telling you what you really want. See, most people don't realise that. Most people don't realise that. Because many of us are working 40 hours a week, which is a fair slice of our life, right? How many hours are there in a, year, a week? I think there's 192? 168? Is it? 168? <coughs> 40 over 168? That's about one quarter, isn't it? So one quarter of my life, I'm working. Around about. Right. Now that job better be a damn good job that I really love, because that's one quarter of my life that's just disappearing down the tube, if it's not. Can you see that? Right. How, many time, how much, how many hours do I sleep? Seven, let's say eight a night, seven eights. Seven eights, 56? Right. We're looking now like getting close to one third, aren't we? Very close. One third of my life I sleep. Why haven't you got a comfortable bed? Why isn't your comfortable bed a huge just king size thing and, and just like heaven to sleep in? Like you just love looking at it. Why isn't it just this awesome place for you to reside in? And why isn't it in this room that you just love being in? Can you see? You're spending one third of your life there. 
right? So why isn't it something that's really, really good? Why, why is it, why is it that this hundred dollar job that you got from the second hand store that's got all these, these, these sort of little, you know, rods going up the back of it and, and everything and you roll over and you've got all these aches and pains when you wake up and you say, oh, I must get a new bed and you never do. Why is it like that? Right? Now, all, toge all together, we're looking at almost half, more than half of our life just gone in those two things. Agreed? Okay. If you're not loving yourself, then you can see that your work's going to show it and your bed's going to show it. Okay. Okay. So let's look at love list. Let's look at the love list from the point of view of God. It's God's perspective. What does God, what did God create you to love that will bring you the most joy and bliss? This is the list. You could think of it as this is God's priorities for you. This is how God created you. The first thing on your love list, God created to be God. You can totally deny it. That's fine, but that's what God created. The second thing on your love list, God created to be your self. Now, when I'm talking about yourself, I'm not talking about yourself as this being, this physical flesh thing. Remember, I'm talking about the soul which is the two halves of the soul, is self. That's our self. You're one half of yourself right at the moment. So when I'm talking about self, I'm talking about self as including your soulmate. Yeah, most of you, a lot of you don't even want to meet your soulmate. Right? <laughs> So there's a big issue. That you don't want to meet half of yourself. Can you see that? That's a big issue emotionally, isn't it? Why would I not want to meet half of myself? I must have some big emotions tied up in that. Like if I think that, the half, let's say I'm a male and I think the other half of myself is a female and if I don't want to meet her, gee whiz, I must have quite a lot of emotions about females to actually not meet the other half of myself. Can you see that? Uh, there's a big emotions in that. All right. Now others. We will break others down into a list. The first set of others is the children. I don't mean your children. I mean all of the children. Why don't I mean just your children? Because in the end, all children... Have, we are a part of their environment. I have a responsibility towards all children to help them grow in the love of their true maker, their true parent, not me, and it's not even their mum and dad. Right? These children are just developing souls and that's why they should form part of our highest love priority. And then other people. Now, I don't just mean people, I mean people here on earth, whether they are, so whether they are mortal, in other words, or here on earth, or a spirit. Because they're all people. So I'd have just as much love for I do for you that I can see to the spirits at the moment that are here. Oh, by the way, there are far more spirits here than, than you are here. That rather than, I would have just as much love for them in the presentation that I'm giving as well. Does that make sense? if I am putting things as God's priority. What comes next from God's perspective, do you think? Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, creatures. creatures, okay. So look, should, should we, do, we can divide creatures up, but let's just put creatures. By creatures, we're talking about living and moving creatures, right? So creatures. Now, from God's perspective... There are two types of creatures. There's the type of creature that has a central nervous system that has a spirit body, and then there's the type of creature that doesn't have a central nervous system and doesn't have a spirit body. All right? So there, to give you an illustration, some creatures on the planet don't have a central nervous system. Um, give an example off the top of my head. Yeah, like a, a, like a mosquito, for example. Right? 
but they're still a creature. They're still a living creature. Right? So, bam, I got rid of that creature. Right? I wouldn't be able to do that so easily if I loved them. And they're biting me. They're biting me. Something I love bites me. Oh, there's an emotion in that. See, everything, there's an emotion. You'll find when you deal with a lot of these emotions, the creatures won't harm you. If you don't deal with the emotions, the creatures reflect back at you the emotions that you have yet to heal within yourself. So if you're a person who gets eaten alive by mosquitoes, there's a lot in that for you emotionally. Does that make sense? But this is our love list. This is God's love list. Creatures, uh, can I just like, central nervous system creatures, and then non-central nervous system creatures. What would come next? So flora, all the all the flora, wouldn't it? So trees, plants, vegetation, food, all these different things, all part of this thing. So, am I loving something if I destroy the whole thing? You know, I've got to look at things like that. That's part of my love list. But I would not sacrifice something lower on my love list for something higher. In other words, I never ever sacrifice my love of God in my entire life. Even if it means me dying, I will not sacrifice my love of God if I have my priorities right. Can you see that? This is my priorities of love. I will never sacrifice God if I, if I have got my priorities right. So if someone asks you to deny God, just a simple question, all you've got to do is deny God or get shot. What would you do? You'd get shot. Okay. Because you wouldn't deny God. That's your priority list. Right. This priority list, by the way, is going to create the most happiness in your life that you can ever imagine. This priority list. But it's a lot of challenge. Because, like, let's look at the next priority, self. All right? You've just been captured in a war and they're going to force you to get into a truck where they're going to take you to a prison, right? They're going to force you to get in this truck. If you don't get in the truck, they're going to shoot you. What will you do? You'll get shot. Because you love yourself more than that. Right? You have free will, and that person has now just broken the law of free will, and you can't agree with that. If I love God, I can't agree with it. And also, if I love myself, I can't agree with it. So I will not do it. So it means I get shot. Thank you. Thank you. I um, would probably think that if I love myself and I'd like to continue living, which many of us do, then why wouldn't I want to get into the truck? You just expressed an emotional injury. Okay. Let's look at the emotional injury. I would like to continue living. I don't want to be shot. If it's a choice in um, get into a truck or be shot, I'm likely but, to but choose But you don't want to get in the truck either? No. But if the other alternative is to be shot and yep. I choose... Uh, I prefer more to avoid being shot than getting into the truck. Why, Why would that be... Because uh, why would I want to die at that point? But you're not dying. Well, See, you, I will. You, you if I... This, is, this is the underlying emotional injury. But why would I want to leave the earth if I still want to... Why would I want my body to die, even though my spirit's not going to? You don't I'm want it ready. to die. They're making the choice, not you. You're making a choice as to what you want for yourself. What you want for yourself is to never have your free will harmed. And you're allowed to make that choice. The truth is you're just expressing an emotional injury in that you don't believe there's an afterlife. You don't believe it's just as good, if not better, than here. right? And, and you're willing to compromise your free will in order to extend your life. And that is an act of hatred towards yourself. I'm a parent and I lost a parent when I was young. Mm -hmm. Why would I want to be shot? Now you're starting to identify 
the causal emotional reason why you feel the way you do. And you're just about to connect to it, so go with it. You, lo you did lose your parent, and that's the thing, the feeling that you're avoiding. Does that make sense? With every single thing we say that's out, har out of harmony with this priority list, there is an emotional reason why we're choosing to do it out of harmony with that list that God created. And what I'm saying is very confronting, yes? Isn't it? Because basically I'm saying if someone's got a gun to your head, if you honoured just the law of free will, you wouldn't do what they ask just because they've got a gun at your head. Does that make sense? Now it's pretty challenging to face, isn't it? The way our the way our society is structured, we, our free will gets impinged upon daily. No, you choose to allow your free will to get impinged upon daily. Okay. So. Why do you do that? Because you're afraid of something. What are you afraid of? Well, just to take road tolls, for example, if I decided to, say, sit at the bridge and not pay the road toll, it feels like just being... I pay the road toll, say, or I agree to the impinges on my free will because it seems... Yeah, but see, the example you're given is not impinging on your free will. See, this is... Many of you have very, very um, distorted viewpoints of free will. The, someone charging you a road toll to go over a bridge is not impinging on your free will because you're a, you can go on another route. Okay. Right? You can choose to go a different direction. Uh, you're choosing to go in that direction because it's the most expedient because you've got other reasons for going in that direction so you pay the toll. Somebody built that bridge and you're actually thanking them for that bridge and by paying the toll. So to me that's not impinging upon your free will. Okay, like I feel that we pay too much taxes. Okay, so that might be impinging on your free will and certainly there's no need for any of us to pay tax. The truth is that we could rearrange the entire economic system so none of us have to pay tax. Yes, right. right. So certainly that's an area we need, need to address with our free will. Yeah. Did you know actually there's not even a law that can force you to pay tax? It's voluntary. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting what we voluntarily do, isn't it? Because we're afraid. You see, a lot of times what's happening is that we don't have God's list of priorities with regard to love so we start compromising. When you compromise these priorities, you will create pain for yourself every time. So, for example, whenever you put others before yourself, in other words, if you have to not love yourself to do something for someone else, you're going to hurt from that. At some point, you will hurt from that. Whenever you put your dog ahead of your child, you are going to feel some pain about that in the future because there are a whole lot of laws you break doing it, believe it or not. So, this is the love list that God has for you. God's basically saying, if you like, God's basically saying, and, and you, this is, you don't have to believe me with this, you can put this into practice. When you live your life like this, you'll find you'll be the happiest you could possibly be. You start breaking the laws in any of these areas, you'll find your happiness will degrade. And you can put that into practice at any time and test this out. But that is the list of love, if you like, that God created for you to live. If you want to, because you have free will, you're allowed to just do that or not do it. It's up to you. All right, so what I do then, so that's, I know this is God's list. So what I do then is I have God's list. And then what I do, this is really exposing. This is how I've exposed lots of my own emotional injuries. What I've done is I look at my last week and look what I did. So last week, what did I do? How much time did I spend communicating, feeling, doing things with God? I oh, know I did uh, half an hour Monday. So, you know, this is fictitious, of course, because I have, it's totally different for me. But let's say I did half an hour Monday, three hours Tuesday, nothing Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, it's too busy. Saturday I did an hour or two. So let's say I did five, six hours. How much time did I spend caring for myself, doing my stuff for myself? All right, well, I slept. So that was like 56 hours. 
and then I, uh, you know, I ate. So that was like how many meals a day? Well, you know, brekkie was only 10 minutes, but lunch was about 15 minutes. So let's say the whole thing was about an hour a day, seven hours. So there's seven hours there. Right. Can you see straight away? I'm, I'm, I'm obviously feeling a lot more for myself than I am for God. Great. Right. Okay. How much of that time did I do for others? Like, oh, well, I work for others mostly. Let's say I, I hate this job, but I do it mostly because I have to bring home some pay for the family. So really, I'm not doing that for myself, am I? I'm just doing it for my family. I'm doing it for others. So there's 40 hours. What else did I do for others this week? Oh, well, I dropped off the kids at school, picked them up, dropped off, picked them up, took them up to, oh, that's right, I, you know, Wednesdays and Fridays they go to, they go to music class and then um, my daughter's got ballet class and then I picked them up from there and ran around. When I add all that up, by the time I add all that, it's another seven hours, let's say, and so forth. Can you see, but by the time we start adding some things up, we start seeing what our real loves are all about. What our real priority list is. Does that make sense? And when you start comparing your real priority list with God's priority list for you, you start being able to see very rapidly why you're unhappy. So it's a great way to expose emotional injuries within yourself. You can start seeing things about yourself. Mary? I did. Um, for me, when you were writing that list, um, I was thinking, I'm not sure that um, hours quantify it correctly for me. Like, when, when I'm um, picking up my daughter from ballet, for example, if I, I can be doing that... Um, while I'm communicating with God and, and really um, loving myself in that exchange. Of course. Yeah, so... So this is why I call it emotional. Yeah. So if we start looking at it from an emotional perspective, I can actually be praying to God every single moment of the day that I do everything else. So every waking moment I could actually be praying. Because remember, praying is a longing inside of your heart for God, right? A longing for God. So... I could actually, of the 168 hours, be doing it 168 hours because I can do it in my sleep state as well as my awake state. And in fact, that's the ideal condition. So I could say emotionally, 168 hours out of 168 hours, I'm longing for God's love. But, but the issue with the time, the real hours, is that it gives you an indication of where you're compromising yourself. So all of these things are just, remember I said at the start of this, it's all just tools to help you access your denied emotions. So these are all just practical tools that you can use to help you access and see what's going on. And what I noticed a lot was this. What I did was I wrote down my overall priority list right at the beginning. Now for me, God has always been emotionally at the top of my list. Right? Then came others. So my children and my partner. And then came birds. Oh, no, no, not, not the feathered variety. I wasn't that keen on a lot of animals except for native animals. And then there was just something that... Then, then of course, flora was my next. These are my loves. My flora, the flora, you know, the plants and everything. I always love plants and everything. I've never really gone for, like, domestic animals. I, I, I would have to say at the beginning... I definitely didn't love any domestic animal. Didn't love dogs. I was bitten by four of them when I was young. So I didn't love dogs. I had an issue with dogs, right? I had an emotional issue. In the first century, part of my face was eaten away by dogs when I was 20. And so since then, I've had emotional issues with dogs that I had to work my way through. So, so I didn't love dogs. Cats, well, my father hated cats, so I couldn't love cats and get my father's love. So, you know, cats were a problem. So I never really loved them. They didn't even make the list. So there were things that didn't even make the list. 
Then I'd have to say things like uh, sort of how inanimate stuff. I haven't put inanimate stuff on this, but that's even underneath. So things like my house, my home, and things like that came next. And then right down the bottom was this person called self, but, it, but actually it was just the half of the self because the soulmate half of the self came right up here. Right? So that was my list. And you know, that list has taken me years to undo. Years of emotional work to undo. Particularly this bit, putting that down there has taken me years to address. I've had literally hundreds and hundreds of emotions to deal with and every emotion that I dealt with made it go up one and made it go up some more and made it go up some more and eventually I got to the point where self was there, where it should be. And to be frank, even now I'm still fluctuating between self and others, self, others, self, others, self, particularly when it comes to my soulmate. So the other half of self still comes before me which is not what's correct to do, but that's still happening. So I'm just in that mode now of just fluctuating there. But it's taken me years of emotional processing to face up to the fact that self was right down the bottom. Right? Now, the beauty of having a list like that and, and writing up, well, what, what was it like this week for you? Where, where did self come this week? Where did you know, caring for the animals come this week? Did it make your list at all? If you're eating meat, caring for the animals didn't come anywhere on your list this week. Okay? You've got to stop being untruthful with yourself. By the way, just a side comment. The divine love sanctuary that some of you have set up is not a divine love sanctuary if you don't impl impl implement divine love laws and principles. So, if, if people go there eating meat, it's no longer a divine love sanctuary. You know, it's no longer a natural love sanctuary even. It's just become the block of land out in the bush now. Can you see that? Because if it was a divine love sanctuary, you'd be wanting to implement divine love laws while you're present on the sanctuary. Wouldn't you? So it is quite hypocritical for us to call something a divine love sanctuary when we're not, in, we're not actually putting in place the divine love laws at the sanctuary. Can you see that? So, so, so either stop calling it a divine love sanctuary or start implementing the divine love laws at the sanctuary. And the divine love laws are going to incorporate this kind of list of priorities for every single person on the property. Does that make sense? Because they are not your laws, are they? They are God's laws. And if I am on the divine love path, I'm not interested in what my opinion is anymore. I am only interested in what God's opinion is. <laughs> Can you see that? And all I'm looking at is bringing my loves and my life and my laws and the principles that govern my life into harmony with the divine love laws. And the beauty of a love list is it should, it's telling you what should make your list of loves. And if I'm eating meat, I am not loving animals. And, and a lot of people say to me, oh, but I love my pets. And they eat meat still, but they love their pet. I'm sorry, you do not love your pet. If you're eating meat still, you do not love your pet. You need your pet for another emotional reason that you need to address because you are not loving your pet if you're eating meat around your pet. They can feel your soul's intention to harm animals. Don't you think that? Of course, they can feel everything. Dogs and cats in particular are so sensitive to your emotions, they can feel everything you feel. Why do you think your cat wants to go out and murder 182 birds or whatever it is a year? It's because of your desire to eat meat and you not working through all of that emotionally and, and some other emotions too, of abundance and so forth. That's why these animals that are close to us do these things. We need to address those issues. So if, if I didn't have any love of others during this week, then others wouldn't even be on my list. Does that make sense? If I didn't have any love of animals during the week because I ate meat during the week, then creatures are not on my list. 
Does that make sense? If I can get a block of land and totally bulldoze every plant on the property, then the love of flora was not on my list this week. And I need to address these loves if I want to bring myself in harmony with God. But what I'm saying is to not be critical of yourself about all these things. The key is just to use this list as a tool to access your causal emotion. Can you see what I'm saying? Use it as a tool to say to yourself, all right, all right, well this week, this week I had alcohol. Am I loving myself if I have alcohol? What's alcohol to your body? It's a poison, right? So I'm ingesting a poison. Is that loving my body? No. So I'm not loving myself when I did that. How many hours a week did I do that? How many hours this week did I have my beer? Now in my case, I used to have a whole collection of red wine. It was a very expensive collection of red wine that took me thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to put together. And once I realised that law, that I wasn't loving myself any, any, anymore, you know what I did? I still compromised love. Because you know what I did? I gave it all away. Which helped every other person who I gave some of that red wine to, to compromise the law of love as well. Now I didn't think of that at the time. I realise that now. I, I probably should have smashed them all. Right? And that would have meant that nobody else was also harmed with their love of self. But I gave it all away. Have a big cry afterwards as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't actually. It was an easy thing to do. But there are some things you'll find are really hard to do when you realise that. Now, what I'm suggesting to you is that if you know that your love list is out of harmony with God's love list, then when you break it, there is more of a penalty of breaking it. Like if you know what to do and you don't do it, it is worse for you than if you, had, than if you didn't even know what to do. And then a lot of people go, oh, right, then, oh, so, okay, okay. So AJ is basically telling us that we shouldn't bother coming along to any more seminars of his anymore because the more he tells us, the worse it gets for us, right? <laughs> No, I'm not saying that, because in the spirit world, you know, there's this whole location in the spirit world, in the first sphere, in the hills, of all the people who wanted to remain ignorant. They used their ignorance as an excuse to not do anything in harmony with love. And that has a large penalty associated with it as well, a large consequence to your soul. So what I'm suggesting is become informed about what makes you happy. Remember I said at the beginning of this love list, that if we bring our loves into harmony with God's loves, that will mean you are the happiest possible person you could ever be. Now eventually, if you do that, you'll become at one with God. Guaranteed. The only reason why we're ever not at one with God, in fact, is because we have our love list out of harmony with God's love list. Right? Can you see that if I am going to be at one with God, I am going to need to love the same things God loves? Can you see that? In the same order, even? Can you see that? And then I'll be in harmony with God's love. So this is an essential part of me becoming in harmony with God's love in the end. So look at your love list. I use the love list quite often for me, and myself and Mary together, we've used it quite often too, haven't we? just to identify what's really going on at the emotional level. And it can help you so much to, ah, okay, there I put my mother ahead of my partner. Many of you do that on a daily basis. Put your in-laws or your parents ahead of your partner or your child even. Many of you go around with your little children to, your, to their grandparents and all of a sudden treat your little children differently because you're, with your grand, because you're with your parents. Because you know they'll be unhappy if your child does this or they'll be unhappy if your child breaks that or, and so you treat your child differently. What's that doing? That's putting your grandparent ahead of your child. Which way was it meant to be around again? The child has to become first because the child is the one who's developing and you're assisting the child to develop. So that has to come first in your loves. And yet often we reverse that. Right? You see, every time we reverse something, we create a disharmony with the law of love. 
Every time we reverse a priority in our love list, we, be, we create so much disharmony with the law of love that there's penalties associated or consequences associated upon our own soul about what we've just created. So do you know what will happen when we've done that with our child and our, grand, and our parent? If our child is now treated differently when we go around to our parents, do you think your child's going to want to go around to your parents anymore? No, that's why half the time we want to say, oh, we go around and visit Nana now. I don't want to visit Nana. I don't want to visit Nana. And why, by the time they get to 15, 16, do they want to visit Nana? No, they don't want to want a bar of Nana. Nana's just there to control my free will. They don't want any part of it. But we created that. We created that by actually putting our parents' laws ahead of our, children, our God's laws for our child. So, so when we bring our love list in harmony with God's laws, you'll find that's when you create the most harmony. Does that make sense to everyone? And so it's a really good way to identify what's going on inside of you emotionally. Oh, just hang a sec. It's also fair to say that we, if we... Um, I just had it so gone. But if we would never um, actually be unloving to creatures if we love God and we love ourselves and we love others. So we're never actually going to sacrifice any... It's never, it's never right to say, I can't love others because I have to love myself because that would never work. Yes, we don't sacrifice one for the other necessarily, but, but we understand that every time I sacrifice one that's on lower on the list, I'm actually sacrificing myself anyway. I'm saying there's a lot more complexity in what I'm describing in this love list, all right? What I'm describing is very basic. It's just as a way of helping you. It's a tool to help you get in touch with some emotions. I'm not saying don't love creatures or I'm not saying don't sacrifice a creature in order to love others. Does that make sense? What I'm saying is use the list to see how you prioritise things in your life in terms of love. Because in the end you will love all of those things. right? But you will certainly love... Uh, your soulmate more than you'll love your children and you'll certainly love your children more than you'll love animals in the end but it doesn't mean you don't love animals so in other words my love of animals would mean that I couldn't kill one even if my child was starving right? so I'm not going to sacrifice the love of one for the other mind you it's when you say sorry if we can have a microphone. Um, when you were talking about grandparents and so forth, and um, free will, of whatever. Sorry? Uh, when you were speaking about grandparents, yep. I'm just wondering where the virtues of respect and um, all those other things come into it. Um, if I respect people, I will automatically respect my grandparents, but I'll also respect my grandchildren. Mm -hmm. I'll also expect, respect everyone. You, as a grandparent, are not more important to me than my children. Mm -hmm. And my children won't be more important to me than you. But from, God's, from a love perspective, I need to take care of how I love my children, and I would not sacrifice my children's will just for you. So, can I just point out something about the word respect? Every time a person asks, asks the question about respect, it means that they feel unrespected. So there's a causal emotion inside of you that you need to deal with. Well, the truth there's is, not in me because I, I'm not a grandparent for a start. It doesn't uh, matter. Yeah. You ask the question about respect. Mm. And the truth is that with regard to the issue of respect, if I respect and love myself mm. and I love God, I will not need anyone else's respect or love. I will not even complain when somebody disrespects me, but the likelihood of it occurring is going to be very low because I already respect myself. Mm. Now, I, I don't think I asked that very well. Um, what I'm, maybe I misunderstood what you were saying. It just seemed to me that you were saying uh, children visiting their grandparents or whatever, whoever... Yep. And uh, them having their own free will. Mm -hmm. But there's a place where we have to 
in society where we do have to follow certain uh, rules. Well, that's what I'm asking you. This is what I teach and now I'm yeah. wondering what I should be teaching. <laughs> Can I just talk about the rules that we have to follow? Right. If we want to be happy, mm -hmm. the only rules we have to follow is God's rules. Mm -hmm. And all of God's rules revolve around love. Mm -hmm. And love naturally incorporates respect. Right? But that, I can't demand respect from another. Respect is something that needs to come from a love space within them. Mm -hmm. And also I need to look at my law of attraction if I'm not respected. If I'm not respected by the other, I need to see, ask myself firstly the question, how much do I not respect myself? Right? Because the more I respect myself, the more respect I will automatically command from others. And I don't mean command in terms of verbally, you must respect me. I mean that you'll feel the feeling inside of myself that I respect myself and you'll automatically want to respect me as a result of that respect that I have for myself. It's very similar about the laws of love of self. So, with regard to teaching children, the only thing we need to teach the child is God's laws of love. And in the end, if they love, they will respect. But they won't respect the person more than they'll respect their own desire, for example. So, not, in other words, let's say I have a desire that's harmonious with love and you want me to not have that desire. Mm -hmm. So let's say my desire harmonious with love is uh, I want my soulmate to be a part of my life. That's my desire harmonious with love. Let's say you're a friend of my soulmates and you just don't like me very much, let's say, and, and you just feel I'm the wrong person for her. Right? Now, I can respect you but disagree with you completely. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to live my life by what you feel should happen. Does that make sense? Yes. So, yes, I do understand all of that. Um, but if I love you, mm -hmm. I will tell you, your desire for me to not be with this girl mm -hmm. is about your emotional injuries. Mm -hmm. And I'll be happy to tell you that what those emotional injuries were even. Mm -hmm. I would be happy to do that if I loved you. If I love and care for you, I, was still not, I wouldn't be angry with you for mm. you telling me that I can't be with her. I wouldn't get upset with you for that. But I would say to you, well, I'm sorry, but what you're asking me to do is out of harmony with my desires. Mm. Out of harmony, therefore, with my love of self. And I'm allowed to love myself, mm. whether you think I am or not. Right? Mm. And this is where if we teach children God's laws of love, then in the end, they'll automatically be respectful. But I've seen so many parents, for example, think they know more than their children when their children know far more than their parents and their parents are not respectful of how much their children know. Um, yeah, um, so. I teach little children mm -hmm. and I, um, uh, one of the things is we teach them virtues, as I've mentioned before, mm -hmm. uh, responsibility, cooperation, respect and amongst a whole heap of other things. Mm -hmm. Um, it just seemed to be contradictory to what you were talking about before that was all, but I do understand more what you yeah, were Yeah, be careful when I talk about free will. Mm. A lot of people think free meal means I can do anything I want, even if it means har harming you. Mm. That's not what I mean. Okay. That's not free will anymore. Because actually, if I'm doing whatever I want, even if it harms you, I'm actually harming my own soul, which is no mm. longer, it's actually constraining my own soul. Mm. So teaching children virtues is great, because mm. that's a part of the natural love principles. If they receive divine love in their heart, a child won't need to be taught the natural love principles, because they'll feel pain whenever they break the divine love principles, mm. and so they don't even need to be taught the natural love principles. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, but free will is often misinterpreted nowadays, right? God gave you the free will to do anything you want, but there's an if associated with it. And you know what the if is? Or you could say there's a but. What's the but? There are consequences. <laughs> there are consequences. We need to teach our children the same things. The truth is that when they break the laws of love, there are consequences, and we need to teach our children that there are consequences for that. And I'll raise that in the, after the break we have in a minute. Because the truth is that when we deal with things appropriately in God's laws, 
you'll find that free will fits in perfectly and it's always loving in the way that God describes it to be. But a lot of times here on the planet, we think free will means do whatever you want to wherever you want to whomever you want and you should be able to get away with it. But God doesn't do that. God doesn't let you get away with it. So why do we let it happen? There is also still a large problem of uh, we feel that we can be the ones to give the consequences instead of them actually coming automatically from God's laws. Yeah. So demanding a child to have virtues and then when they don't display them, then giving them consequences for so that. So in other words, punishing them for not having a virtue doesn't help them have the virtue. Yeah. Yeah. Alright, well what we'll do now is have a break. We'll come back at uh, four. What we'll do is we'll start discussing some of the actual things that happen at a childhood level about emotions and see how we can deal with them.